So good morning once again. Um, I'd like to uh, in some ways follow on from what I talked about yesterday, but um, this time in the context of the Aparzan project, which is one of the uh, one of several projects which I led. These are EU funded projects, quite large, uh, with a lot of uh, members. Uh, the Aparzan stands for Alliance for Permanent Access to the Records of Science, kind of a historical name uh, in Europe uh, network. Um, and it involved a lot of partners, about 30, more than 30 partners. You'll recognize many of these logos. It had um, scientific repositories, uh, commercial organizations like uh, IBM, uh, s large ones, small commercial organizations like Globit, other um, uh, membership organizations like the DPC and uh, LIBA, uh, publishers organizations, um, vari various national organizations like DANS in the social sciences, Helmholtz and sciences, other commercial organizations over here, uh, Inmark and uh, Tessella, uh, and university spin-offs like uh, Secure and um, the uh, Russians and UK Data Archive, British Library, Airbus. So lots of members, lots of different views. Their common point was that they were, uh, they had an interest in digital preservation. And this project was uh, formed to try to understand what the, um, what really worked in digital preservation. Uh, so the motivation was that um, they all needed to preserve for one reason or another. So Airbus had to preserve its aircraft designs because there are legal reasons that they have to keep these for, I think, around uh, 50 years after the end of production of a particular model. Uh, the British Library had its... Um, own remit to preserve, and the same for many of the other organizations. Um, and they'd all done research of, of one sort or another, many with EU funding. Um, but the problem with that sort of funding, and it may also be true of national funding, is it causes fragmentation. Because those of you who've been involved with um, putting in bids for funding, you know that they have to be innovative, they have to be novel, they have to be different from everything else, and they have to address strange things that seem sexy to the funders. But what, it, what that means is that everybody does something different. Everybody claims to be solving large numbers of problems because if you only solve one problem really well, then you don't get the funding. So this is a, a big problem. So the uh, European Union, one part of it, had put in, I think, around 150 million euros, maybe more, into digital preservation projects. But I must say that um, the European Union no longer funds those sorts of projects. And the reason is that it was difficult to answer certain questions, one of which was, what's the end result? What, what advice can you give to people to do digital preservation after all this research? And to my mind, the problem was fragmentation. We were all kind of enemies because we had to argue that our solution was better than your solution. And of course, this just leads to uh, big problems. 
Now, everybody agrees that there's no one solution, no one piece of software, no one single technique that's magic and does the, that solves the problem for everybody. And, but, I mean, that's reasonable. But what is, uh, le what is more difficult to deal with are all these claims about solutions. As I say, everybody has to claim that they solve pretty well all the problems in the universe if they're going to get funding. And yet, if, you're, uh, if you have a particular problem, which of these tools can you use? Which technique? You can go to websites, and there are lists of a 100 different tools or techniques. There are lots of these lists. And most of them are the same. But there's no way to choose between them. No good advice about uh, what works. So one of the aims of um, this project was to bring together all of these people, all of these organizations that had worked, done research in different projects uh, for different reasons, and try to figure out honestly, just you know, within the, the privacy of, of our, um, uh, our consortium, which honestly did work. Now, now the truth is that all of them worked. And we, uh, so, so you, you have 30 organizations, many more people, and, of course, if we all just got in a room and argued, that would not lead to any positive results. So we agreed on one thing. And that one thing was that none of us are mad. And none of us are, are dishonest. We just have, we've been forced to make promises that are too big. So what we were trying to do then is to say, well, you have this technique, and that's the one that you push, but what are the limits? So I argued yesterday that uh, there are many different sorts of digital objects that we need to preserve. And I suggested a particular way of uh, dividing up the world to have a map. Now, I did not have time to go into uh, a lot of details about that, but what one can try to do is to ask the question, uh, which, given a tool or a technique or a method of doing things, what does it apply to? Does it just apply to uh, PDFs? Can it work for... Um, uh, genomic uh, data? Can it work for aircraft designs using um, you know, complex computer-aided design software? I suspect the answer is no. But that does not mean it's a bad solution. It just means that it only works for the, this limited area. And the hope was that if we could map out the... Uh, the domain of digital preservation, then we could identify which tools worked where. I've described a little bit about that yesterday. But equally, we could identify areas where uh, there was nothing. There had been no research done. There was a, uh, um, a gap in our knowledge and our capabilities. So we... Uh, we needed a, a roadmap, and we needed to bring together all of the different work that had been done. We were not trying to do new research and come up with new techniques. We were trying to just look honestly at everything that's out there. Remember, we agreed that none of us are crazy, none of us are bad or dishonest. We just have to talk together and test uh, the various techniques 
in order to uh, identify what the boundaries of usefulness are. Uh, and we also hope that that would be a way to um, guide us when we look at new challenges, because we know that there are lots of new sorts of digital objects uh, uh, being uh, produced out there. That, as archivists, you will one day need to, uh, to preserve. So uh, I've had this sort of list uh, yesterday, um, but I'd like to introduce the, um, uh, the concept that these are things that are our intellectual capital in digital form. They're important for us to keep. Um, because if we, if we do this wrong, then some of these things are just not replaceable. And I put here, we will be in trouble. And this involves, you know, obviously, uh, the scientific data documents, but also uh, private uh, repositories, pharmaceuticals, aerospace. Although even now, the, uh, some of the pharmaceuticals are opening up their data to try to get fresh ideas in to, uh, you, to getting value out of the data that they've spent so much money collecting. So people are looking at the, uh, the data, as several speakers said yesterday, as potential value. So how do you ensure that, um, uh, that, we, that the data is there, the digital objects are there, in order to gain value from them? Uh, there are also, of course, legal, um, uh, not only legal documents, but uh, legal issues surrounding all these things. There are issues of privacy, uh, the uh, uh, legally mandated um, uh, lengths of time to which these things need to be kept in uh, the medical area, the aerospace, manufacturing, food safety, hospitals, it's different be between different countries. And even in the USA, different states have different uh, uh, lengths of time that these things have to be kept. Uh, but there's a commonality that these things are decades or they're the lifetime of a patient or something like that. It's, none of them say you just keep them for a few years. So these are real problems when we know lots of things will be changed. And of course, the, uh, in the financial world, uh, the business world, there are many other things that need to be kept you know, beyond the simple documents. And of course, the things that our social uh, networks rely on and so much more. So a vast uh, variety of uh, types of digital objects. So there are... Of course, the obvious uh, threats to digital preservation. Um, I think that things like uh, bit rot and changes in hardware and software, they're still a challenge, but they are uh, solvable. Um, if you talk to people in CERN who have maybe the largest amount of uh, um, uh, accessible data in the, uh, in the world, you know, many tens of petabytes that's growing at an enormous rate, then uh, because of their particular environment, they have some very good cost models and very good uh, numbers for the uh, raw uh, bit loss rate uh, per terabyte. And it's, uh, they have a very large organization and a lot of money, but still they, the amount of money per, per petabyte is, is quite, uh, 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 quite reasonable compared to the smaller scale uh, uh, efforts that uh, one sometimes sees. And that's, of course, the, just uh, another way of looking at the advantages of scale that the cloud gives us. Um, so these sort of things we can probably handle. We, we can see how to handle, but 
they do cost money. The gradual loss of usability is the thing that I've been mostly focused on in, uh, in the work that I've been doing. But equally, there are changes in legal rights, rights that expire. They're encoded in different ways. I touched on it yesterday during the question and answer session that um, legal rights uh, change as you move from one country, you take a digital object, maybe a photograph of somebody in one country, you use it in another country or in a different uh, uh, judicial uh, system. So all of these things need to be uh, tracked. Uh, and of course, authenticity is quite key to um, certainly in the archival world, but uh, especially now in the scientific world where climate change uh, relies on data and um, very difficult questions can be asked about the authenticity of the, uh, of the data that's used to support claims about climate change. Um, and you know very well that uh, there are some very um, uh, um, tenacious uh, opponents to claims of climate change, and it could cause massive changes to society to uh, counteract um, uh, climate change. So there are lots of things that have vast uh, societal importance uh, where digital preservation techniques are important. So I've been through this list uh, uh, yesterday, and I think um, that there's no need to go through it in detail now, but um, there are things um, that I'd like to stress, and that, and that is that there are many options, and it does depend on how much risk you're prepared to, uh, to live with, or your funders are prepared to live with. But of course, one has to give an honest assessment of that risk. I, I heard, I think um, uh, you were talking about bringing risk into digital preservation, and there is a, a balance between you know, how much it costs versus what the, what the risk is. So the less money you spend, the more risky it is normally. Um, and so you have, but you have to be able to get some handle on what that balance is. And of course, besides bit preservation, where, for example, the people at CERN have um, very uh, detailed uh, spreadsheets that if you put in your assumptions, they know the, uh, they work closely, non-disclosure agreements with the um, big, uh, especially the tape manufacturers, storage manufacturers. They know what their plans are out uh, for quite a long way into the future. And in their particular system, depending on the assumptions you put in, 90% of the costs of, of um, of just keeping the bits is spent in the first nine years of the system. You know, out to infinity is becomes just that 10%. And that's because the, the density, what, 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 what initially might involve 100 tapes, each of which are very expensive and need big machines to big jukeboxes to store them, you know, when you replace the uh, media after a few years, it comes to 10 tapes. And then after another, say, three years, it comes to one tape. And then you replace the media, and then it's just a small part of one tape. And that's much cheaper to manage. So because the, the amount of data that we have to deal with is growing, the cost of any one particular item uh, becomes less over time. So, digital, but nevertheless, digital preservation does present its uh, difficulties, and we do need to bring things together. So, what we tried to do in a parson was to look at all of the different things we were, all of these organisations were working on, 
and we tried to uh, divide them into uh, into silos so that we can we had something reasonable we could handle and then we tried to integrate these things together uh, increasingly as we brought in more concepts and we were looking at more different things so what we ended up with was was a kind of a model just just a picture uh, but there's a lot of information behind it but you can ask why there are so many models out there i mean here are some of them you can see this sort of thing uh, uh, these all come from uh, a a large collection of, uh, a large search out there. This one you might recognize as the DCC model that I had some part in. This is the Caspar model. These are all taken from uh, a report about uh, life cycle models. Then there are more which bring in some very crude, some quite detailed, uh, some with many, many um, uh, issues involved in there. Uh, and so forth. So these things, uh, there's no shortage of models. So why did we need another one? Uh, and again, there's a reference to where all these things come from. Uh, well, we felt that they didn't, they did not um, allow us to put the emphasis of where we thought it should be. So I'll show you this. Um, uh, model in a moment, but the what we thought was missing was that, uh, well, there was, a, people may know of something called the Blue Ribbon um, Task Force Report, but sustainability of, of digital materials, yeah? I see a few people nodding. And they were trying to answer the question that we had been asked in a parson almost from the beginning, and that is, who pays and why? Because it costs money. I mean, it would be nice to say, oh, yeah, I can put it on this little disc or something, and I'll just put that up the same way as I put a book on a shelf, and then in a 100 uh, years, I can come along, and it'll be fine. Nobody believes that, not least uh, because even if the readers are still available, as I uh, argued yesterday, uh, the usability of those bits uh, disappears over time unless you are actively preserving them. So it costs money over a long time. If you've got the money, if there are things that you're constantly getting benefit from, then that's not really a problem. The problem is if the payback is not immediate, then you need to justify things because you cannot just not, not spend money on keeping the bits because you're not gaining benefit immediately because you may gain benefit later on. And this is what the Blue Ribbon Task Force said, that one needs to think about the potential value. It may be that after you know, 10, 20 years, you think, well, look, it's just too expensive. I have to throw something out. I cannot see that this is going to be of any use or of any benefit. So maybe that could be left to rot or thrown away. But there has to be some period of grace, some, some period when you try to make those decisions in a sensible way. Um, so one needs to identify potential value and if possible, do our best to increase and maintain that value. Now, luckily, the, um, the OEIS is based on um, usability as the fundamental test of digital preservation. So this is the rather strange model that we uh, drew. You see here, preservation is not at the top, it's down at the side here. Um, it's sort of sitting on a base of usability and the idea is that um, we're in, let, because we're in the digital preservation world, we're interested in preservation. Preservation, if you follow OEIS, is judged on the basis of continued usability, okay, by the designated community. 
but you can but a repository controls that it can start to think of uh, how it can increase that designated community or increase the community that can use the data and all based on the usability you then can gain value uh, but just having potential value is not enough. You need to think of the business cases, and this is something that the uh, business world has been doing for a long time. So there are many techniques, not in the digital preservation world, but in the business world. And then th there'll always be lots of different possibilities, but at some point you need to develop a business model of how to gain benefit. Now, of course, I'm... I'm talking as if it's all going to be monetary uh, um, value, but uh, very often it's just um, national pride or whatever, or ju things kept just in case or for legal reasons, because if you don't keep it, you'll be heavily penalized by the legal system. So, but you need to understand these things in order to then come to this point, at which, at which stage you can then justify the, uh, the effort that's needed, the resources that, that are needed for preservation. So there's this sort of circle that goes around. You can see many things in here, costs, uh, selection, authenticity, digital rights, governance, and the various things to do with um, uh, preservation. Uh, sitting around it, what I've got is a circle of OAIS concepts plus other things, plus, an, plus extensions of OAIS uh, concepts. And then around that is training that supports the, the human resources that uh, can do these things. Uh, while sitting on the outside here, there's audit which uh, allows one to make a judgment about whether preservation is being done uh, adequately. Now, um, I'm not going to go through all of these things. The slides will be available, but I also want to point to some online resources. So what we did was to look at the, um, uh, the work that had been done in each of these areas. Uh, to try to make some evaluation about uh, what worked where, what worked for which objects, what worked in which circumstances. So um, for each of these things, again, I'm not going to go th through these in detail. The slides will be available. But uh, what we have is... Uh, what I've given here are some resources. So I hope that uh, if I click on this, then you will see um, this, which is um, actually a, uh, a clickable uh, resource. There we are. And behind each of these, there are... Um, uh, collections of analyses of different projects, different tools, trying to identify oh, what the issue is that they address, uh, where these things come from, what the asset is that's left behind, and then, most importantly, the evidence that um, can be used to support the claims about the usability of those particular things. Uh, and you can click on. Um, oh, I lost it. You can click on all of these different uh, areas. One of which, for example, is terminology, which can be extremely important, because what you'll notice is that, uh, of course, OEIS defines a particular set of terminology, set of terms. Some of which are used in the um, uh, uh, conformance assessment, but others are just very useful concepts. But if you look around, there are lots of other glossaries of terms. And you know the strange thing? None of them cross-reference any other one. 
they all define slightly, di use different words, different definitions. What does it mean? How, wh what is the relationship between this term that's used by the Library of New Zealand and OEIS or inter pares or the SNEA uh, dictionary? I hope this will come up in a moment. Oh, no, oh, that's not it. Um, sorry, I clicked on the wrong part. Um, I should have clicked. That one, I think. Ah, yes, here we are. So this was an attempt that we made to uh, look at these different glossaries. So there's OEIS, which is the fundamental one, and these you probably ha know of uh, several others. And the idea was to use the, uh, the SCOS ontology, which basically allows you to say, uh, let's have a look. Uh, here we are, here's something, um, here's a record, right. Records, archivists know uh, there are several definitions out there. I think probably I've missed out the, uh, some of the ISO definitions, but here's into pares. There's a narrower term, which is created record, and uh, there are broader terms, which is information. And these come from these different glossaries. This was an attempt to try to, to help people because different, pay, different publications, different organizations, they all use different terms. Of course, this is just in English. I apologize for that, but um, uh, that's where a lot of these things uh, reside, or that's how a lot of these things are written. Sometimes they use the same word, record. This is the um, uh, National Library of New Zealand, I think. Um, but with a different definition. So in that case, I've um, made the difference clear by adding an annotation, um, adding the initials of the source uh, bes beside them. And here's the, um, I think, the National Library of New Zealand's definition. So they're all different, sometimes subtly, sometimes uh, very, very different. What SCOS allows you to do is the minimum, which is to say, is it related at all? Is it broader or is it narrower? Uh, and I hope that, or we hope that that uh, is another tool to help in uh, making the, uh, in understanding digital preservation. So I think I'd better, I think that's my uh, 30 minutes. So yeah, so I'll stop there and I'll just go on uh, to just go back to the, oops, wrong one. Just go back to this slide, uh, where there are several um, sources of information, uh, some of which are being updated. Um, so if you do find any problems with any of these links, please let me know. You've got my email address. So thank you very much. <laughs>